Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the InSteel Industries second quarter 2020 conference call. At this time, our participants' lines are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during this session, you need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today. H. Walt, NCL President and CEO, thank you. Please go ahead, sir. Good morning. Thank you for your interest in InSteel, and welcome to our second quarter 2020 earnings call, which will be conducted by Mike Gazmarian, our Vice President, CFO, and Treasurer, and me. Before we begin, let me remind you that some of the comments made on today's call are considered to be forward-looking statements which are subject to various risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those projected. These risk factors are described in our periodic filings with the SEC. All forward-looking statements are based on our current expectations and information that is currently available. We do not assume any obligation to update these statements in the future to reflect the occurrence of anticipated or unanticipated events or new information. I'll now turn the call over to Mike to review our second quarter financial results and market outlook, then I'll follow up to comment more on business conditions and other recent developments. Thank you, H, and good morning to everyone joining us on the call. As we reported earlier today, despite continued margin pressure in our market subject to import competition, InSeal posted strong results for the second quarter of fiscal 2020 excluding the non-recurring charges and gain that were referenced in our release. Net earnings rose to $0.29 cents a share from a penny a share last year. The earnings improvement for the quarter was driven by wider spreads between selling prices and raw material costs and strengthening demand for our concrete reinforcing products. Shipments for the quarter rose 19.2% from last year and 19.7% sequentially from Q1 rising to their highest level since the third quarter of 2018 and the third highest in our history for the second quarter. The strong shipping performance was driven by increased construction activity across most of our markets, supported by the generally more favorable weather conditions this year. Average selling prices fell sequentially for the fifth straight quarter, but to a lesser extent, declining 1.2% from Q1. The pricing pressure continued to be more severe in certain of our PC strand and standard welded wire reinforcement markets susceptible to import competition, which represented around 25% of our overall sales for the quarter. ASPs for these markets dropped 22% year over year, which was double the 11% reduction for the remainder of our business. As we conveyed on previous calls, import competition in these markets has intensified in the wake of the Section 232 tariffs on imported steel, which apply to imports of our primary raw material hot rolled steel wire rod, but not to our finished products. The program has incentivized foreign competitors to ramp up their downstream exports and aggressively undersell U.S. producers, resulting in material injury to the domestic PC strand industry. Gross profit for the quarter increased $8.3 million from a year ago, and gross margin widened 700 basis points to 13.3% from 6.3%, primarily due to the higher spreads and, to a lesser extent, the increase in shipments, while on a sequential basis, gross profit rose $9 million from the first quarter, and gross margin widened 690 basis points, driven by the same factors together with lower manufacturing costs. There continued to be a wide disparity in the relative profitability of our plants during the quarter, with the location supplying markets subject to import competition significantly underperforming our other facilities. If you roll up the plants that have been more adversely affected by imports, their combined gross profit amounted to 0.7 million, or a gross margin of only 2.3% on around a quarter of our sales, as compared to 14.6 million of gross profit or a 17.2% gross margin for the remainder of our business. SG&A expense for the quarter rose 3 million to 9.6 million from 6.6 million or 8.4% in net sales from 5.9% last year. 
The sharp increase is primarily driven by an unfavorable 1.8 million year-over-year change in the cash surrender value of life insurance policies due to the downturn in the financial markets, with the remainder largely from increases in incentive and stock-based compensation and legal expense. Our effective tax rate through the first half of the year fell to 21.4% from 23.9% last year due to a $0.2 million benefit recorded in the quarter related to the NOL carryback provisions of the CARES Act. Excluding this benefit, our effective rate for the first half of the year would have been 24.4% as compared to last year's 23.9%. Looking ahead to the remainder of the year, we expect our effective rate will run around 23% subject to the level of pre-tax earnings, book tax differences, and the other assumptions and estimates entering into our tax provision calculation. Moving to the balance sheet and cash flow statement, operating activities used $3 million of cash for the quarter due to a $13.8 million build in working capital driven by increases in receivables and, to a much lesser extent, inventories on the higher sales. Based on our sales forecast for Q3, our quarter-end inventories, represented two and a half months of shipments compared with 2.9 months at the end of the first quarter. And on an overall basis, average unit carrying values are relatively close to the amounts reflected in Q2 cost of sales. After funding the Strantec acquisition, we ended the quarter with $40.4 million of cash on hand, or over $2 a share, and no borrowings outstanding on our $100 million revolving credit facility providing us with ample financial flexibility and the ability to pursue additional growth opportunities that may develop in this challenging environment. In allocating our cash flow and managing the cyclical nature of our business, we remain focused on three objectives, reinvesting in the business for growth and to improve our costs and productivity, maintaining adequate financial strength and flexibility, and returning capital to our shareholders in a disciplined manner. Going forward, we will continue to balance these objectives in deploying capital and any excess cash. As we look ahead to the second half of the fiscal year, our visibility is limited due to the heightened uncertainty resulting from the COVID-19 outbreak and the actions taken by governmental authorities to control the spread of the virus. With our business deemed to be critical infrastructure by the Department of Homeland Security, the pandemic has had a minimal effect on in-steel thus far as we have not experienced any disruptions in our operations and our customers have remained busy working through backlogs. Going forward, however, its eventual impact will be determined based on future developments that are highly uncertain depending on the severity and duration of the outbreak and the effectiveness of the actions that are taken to contain or mitigate it. In view of our debt-free balance sheet, our high liquidity and undrawn credit facility, and our highly variable cost structure, We believe that we are ideally positioned to navigate through these challenges and remain hopeful they could be a catalyst for further growth opportunities to become available. I will now turn the call back over to H. Thank you, Mike. As Mike indicated, our second quarter results reflect strong shipment growth relative to the prior year, driven by favorable underlying demand for our concrete reinforcing products and a return to more normalized seasonal weather patterns. We also benefited from the closer alignment between our raw material costs and average selling prices. We're pleased with the solid underlying demand for our products and our Q2 financial performance. In response to the COVID-19 outbreak, we've implemented and are observing CDC-recommended procedures for managing our exposure to the pandemic and its transmission at our plants as well as at our administrative offices. With our industry deemed essential, all our manufacturing facilities have continued to operate on regular schedules and order entry has remained robust, although we've seen some moderation over the last week in those geographic regions of the country that have been most impacted by COVID-19. Although we're unable to predict the ultimate impact of the virus on our business, The overwhelming majority of our customers intend to adhere to their normal operating schedules while observing the requisite procedures to address its spread. We remain committed to fulfilling their requirements, provided that we can do so without compromising the safety of our people. 
Should we eventually experience a precipitous drop-off in demand, we're prepared to make the appropriate adjustments to our operating plans. Last month, we completed the acquisition of certain assets of Strantec Manufacturing, a competing PC strand producer located in Somerville, South Carolina. As we indicated in our release announcing the transaction, we plan to close the Somerville facility and service STM's customers from our other three PC strand plants. We expect that manufacturing activities will cease tomorrow following the conversion of remaining work in process into finished goods. Additionally, a significant portion of our engineering group has been deployed in Somerville, refining our plans to upgrade certain of the equipment prior to its relocation to other in-steel facilities, a process that will continue for several weeks. Up to this point, we believe the transition for STM's former customers has been seamless and we're pleased with our retention rate. We're continuing to pursue employment operation opportunities for former STM employees who have expressed interest in relocating to in-steel facilities, although that process has been complicated by the challenges posed by COVID-19. We plan on listing the Somerville real estate for sale in the very near future and are evaluating options for disposing of the excess machinery, equipment, and other assets located at the facility. We're pleased with the substantial progress that's been made in executing our integration plans, and we're confident that the transaction will generate attractive returns for our shareholders. Shifting to another recent development, today, InSteel, together with two other domestic PC strand producers, filed anti-dumping petitions against 15 countries, representing 89% of total PC strand imports entering the U.S. in 2019, in addition to a countervailing duty petition alleging illegal subsidies against Turkey. The scope of the filings, which allege dumping margins from 24% to 194%, reflects the egregious behavior of PC strand producers from these countries in the U.S. market over the 2017 to 2019 investigation period. We expect the Department of Commerce investigation will run from the first half of May until around the end of May 2021 with milestones tentatively scheduled for June, July, and September 2020, and April and May 2021. I should point out, however, that the timeline for the cases could be impacted by procedural considerations at the Department of Commerce and the International Trade Commission. As with any litigation, it's not possible to pr predict the outcome of these cases but we believe the allegations are strongly supported by underlying facts in our extensive analysis. Turning to CapEx, we had previously estimated 2020 expenditures of approximately 17 million subject to revisions as we moved through the year. Our progress on certain significant projects was delayed following the failure of a new production line which came online a year ago to meet all our acceptance criteria. During the second quarter, the equipment vendor completed substantial modifications to the line which resolved the performance deficiencies. As a result of the delay, a significant portion of this year's outlays are now expected to fall into 2021, and our 2020 CapEx is likely to come in under our initial estimate. I should note, however, that we are not deferring or canceling any planned projects. We are pushing ahead aggressively with our plans, which are focused on significantly reducing our production costs in addition to broadening our product capabilities in certain markets, expanding our engineered structural mesh capacity, and upgrading our information systems technology. In summary, the outlook for 2020 has become highly uncertain. While our business has remained strong up to this point, we expect to see some softening in coming months as the economy bears the full weight of the COVID-19 mitigation measures. 
We'll continue to closely monitor market conditions and aggressively pursue the appropriate actions to optimize our costs. We'll also continue to be vigilant in pursuing attractive growth opportunities, both organic and through acquisition. This concludes our prepared remarks and we'll now take your questions. Justin, would you please explain the procedure for asking questions? Thank you, sir. As a reminder, to ask a question, you need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And once again, that is star 1 if you'd like to ask a question. And our first question comes from Julio Romero from Sedoti & Company. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning, everyone. I hope you're staying healthy. Yep. Good morning, Julio. Thanks, Julio. Guess to start, can you just talk about the, the current operating environment at, at your facilities? I understand things are changing pretty rapidly, but, you know, are, are you having social distancing in, in your manufacturing lines? Are um, you seeing any distribution challenges, et cetera? Yeah, we're, we've adopted and are observing all the procedures that have been recommended by CDC as well as other knowledgeable sources, which include social distancing and aggressive um, cleaning procedures. Um, we've also staggered shift reporting where required, um, but we're 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 doing everything that we possibly can to mitigate the risk that, that's posed by COVID-19. Okay, fair enough. I guess turning over to Strantech, um, can you maybe talk about the margin profile of that business and how we should think about? I know they did 29 million in sales last year, but you know. Who captures those sales, right? Do you guys expect to capture most of that, or, or does that kind of become a jump ball for the for the industry? Well, I think in one respect our timing was was uh, was favorable with Strantech, as um, the entire industry has developed concerns that that go beyond simply sourcing, um, and and I think as a result, um, the environment's been favorable for us. But at the end of the day. Customers buy because your service meets their expectations, your pricing meets their expectations, and your quality meets their expectations. And we're convinced that we can offer Strantex customer base improvements um, in the overall value that we, we deliver to them. So we're pleased with the retention rate up to this point, but it's one of these things where we have to earn their, their confidence every day, Julia. Julio, um, with regard to the margin profile, it should be pretty pretty attractive following the um, reassignment of that business to our facilities where and we'll just gain from the operating leverage benefit and, and you know, the incremental costs associated with that additional volume should be should be pretty favorable. So I would I would expect that um, just from a margin standpoint it you know it should be positive relative to our our overall um, business. Got it. That's helpful. And then I guess just on CapEx, um, I know you talked about in your prepared remarks that, you know, as a result of the, the delay, 2020 CapEx likely to come in under the $17 million you had initially expected. Um, but I know in the Strand Tech press release, you talked about how that deal, you know, absorbing that equipment lowers your CapEx requirements going forward. So I guess, you know, how does, can you just talk about how that, the Strand Tech acquisition also affects your CapEx? outlook going forward. Yeah, well, first I, I, I would tell you that the, the statement about CapEx avoidance through the Strantech transaction, transaction is absolutely correct, but um, the CapEx that we will avoid uh, was not necessarily planned for 2020. Um, it, would have, it would have come at us um, in 2021 and 22 for the most part. So, um, so the, the timing is an, is an issue there. And it's hard to say exactly what some project delays will mean to 2020 CapEx. It all depends on, on when we make deposits for new equipment, whether that falls in this year or next year. It, it's hard to say. Understood. I appreciate that. Um, I'll hop back into queue and let others uh, ask some questions. Thanks very much. Thank you. And again, ladies and gentlemen, that is star one if you'd like to ask a question. 
And our next question comes from Tyson Bauer from KC Capital. Your line is now open. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Tyson. Tyson. On the STM, the $29 million, uh, since they're feeling the same impacts from the tariffs and the uh, imports, would you suggest that $29 million is a far, you know, is a level that is pretty well insulated because they were doing much more years prior when we didn't have the tariffs and those things? And would you suggest that that would be somewhat in, uh, stable as we go forward because they've already taken the brunt of the industry hits that they were going to take? Yeah, I think um, the market had not been kind to Strantec over the last couple of years, and, and volume had um, had declined for them. Um, hard hard to say whether they had reached bottom, um, but we don't expect any deterioration of their, the underlying customer base that was that was there when we made the, the acquisition. And did their customer base pretty well mirror your own? It actually actually is more favorable than than um, ours in that they had minimal presence in in the post tension segment of that market, which is the segment which has generally been subject to the to the the most import competition. Okay, uh, would you expect minimal SGNA um, increases going forward, as this seems to be a more of an asset purchase, and uh, you're just incorporating it back to your own facilities? That's that's correct. Yeah, there wouldn't be any SGNA impact other than to the extent that it contributes to improved results, and that that impacts um, you know, the, the performance incentive plans. But no incremental staffing requirements associated with uh, absorbing the additional volume. Okay. In the original press release, you talked about some clawbacks to your purchase price, which included the uh, potential eight million sale of the facility. Uh, that you'll do uh, market willing. Uh, other asset sales, uh, did they also have any excess networking capital that we could uh, add back or net out to the purchase price? No, I think their networking capital position was um, was really right in line with what, what you would, would expect. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't anticipate any adjustments relating to that. Okay. Um, at least here in the Midwest, which is probably obviously much different than the Northeast, uh, there's been discussions and uh, news items regarding infrastructure projects that have actually been pulled forward, one, because of the weather, two, because of less traffic and other uh, impediments that may have created at-night only work or otherwise. Have you seen that in other areas, too, and have you seen a benefit of a speed-up on certain projects? Um, Tyson, we read the same information, and and we're aware of of the acceleration of certain projects. My sense is most of those are repair in nature um, and, and that they wouldn't really affect underlying demand for our products, which typically um, go in the ground or, or are um, cast in place in nature and not subject to um, rapid uh, schedule acceleration based on, on short-term events. Okay. And have you also seen, at least in talking to various um, industries, it seems like what's on schedule will occur as it is scheduled to occur, things that did not have a schedule those are the ones at risk of postponement or delays, not necessarily cancellation, but just a cautious stance on starting something new that wasn't already scheduled. Are you seeing that also? Well, I think we're aware, think, we're aware of those concerns, but, but I, are we actually seeing it? I, I don't think so. And I, mean, I think the real matter is funding and what's the, what's the funding um, outlook over time um, as a result of, of depressed tax receipts um, across the board. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we've seen any, I don't think we've seen any impact from that um, thus far. I mean, in the end, it's just going to be a function of the, of, um, you know, how long, how long the the pandemic persists and when we, when, you know, when we get a resolution and because, because as it stands now, I think our customers have largely remained busy 
working through their existing backlogs. It's, it's more an issue of um, the, the flow of new projects into the pipeline and the extent to which that that gets impacted. And that, that switch doesn't turn off immediately. There's a time lag there. So, I mean, I think it will just be a function of the, the duration of, of COVID, COVID-19. All right. Characterize kind of that domestic wire rod supply and, and pricing, and I think we have a, a facility that will be shutting down here or has shut down, um, and kind of the margin implications. Does that help you keep your pricing a little more sticky due to that situation? Well, that's, I think that's a good question, and, and it's going to play out over time. I mean, clearly we've seen um, – dramatic downward moves in scrap. We've seen um, a great deal of uncertainty in the market, which um, which um, is expected under the circumstances. Uh, I sense that capacity is not a problem at all. Delivery times are short. Um, and, and for anyone who needs wire rod in this environment, um, you probably ha- have a, a more competitive situation for supply than you would have prior to all of this happening. Okay, and the next question is a loaded question for you. The discussion of a uh, stimulus for uh, seems to, on both parties, include some type of infrastructure component to it. Uh, Administration seems on board. Uh, Leadership in the House seems to be on board for that. Would you think that's more likely to occur or being successful on your anti-dumping um, filing against those 15 countries on the PC strand, or can you get both? Well, I think they're independent of one another and certainly not mutually exclusive. Um, I, I don't see how the federal government doesn't ante up here on, on an infrastructure bill under the circumstances uh, I think that will happen, although although it's still speculative. Um, on the anti-dumping cases, um, they I really see it having nothing to do with in, any infrastructure bill. This is a matter of of the facts that are on the record and whether the allegations can be supported um, by those facts, and, and we we believe strongly that they can. Well, they could certainly make the infrastructure more of a Buy America component, as we've seen in the past that would certainly help you out in not requiring that anti-dumping immediately. Well, I mean, for, for, for the Buy America coverage to be expanded would take a legislative act that, that um, I wouldn't expect and I've heard no rumblings of. Um, on, on, the, on the dumping cases, um, the impact there, um, if we're successful, should be simply that our foreign competitors are forced to play by the rules rather than that they can't play at all. So um, we'll just have to see what, what happens. You know, we've competed with imports in PC Strand for 25 years, and we've done so successfully um, uh, until recently when, um, when they really didn't play by the rules. So we're, we're hoping just to restore a level playing field here. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And I'm showing no further questions. I would now like to turn the call back to H. Walt, Enfield President and CEO, for closing remarks. Thank you. We appreciate your interest in the company, um, and we look forward to talking to you next quarter. In the meantime, don't hesitate to contact us if you have questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.